So we take a trip in the past, 20,000 years. Uh, so it's a bit off topic, but I think it's very important because there are many events happening today uh, that are uh, relevant, that for which the lesson of 20,000 years ago may be relevant. For instance, the fact that the level of intelligence that is being uh, made irrelevant by the progress of artificial intelligence is about now 100 and is going up. So it's going to induce a profound transformation uh, from the technology to the genotype profile. And that's what we are going to see now. As a motivation, I mean, I want to explain why. Why am I looking at 20,000 years? So that's the hypothesis we test. We test the hypothesis that in the recent past, about less than 20,000 years ago, before present, BP is always before present, present is 1950 for carbon dating reasons, there has been a selective force operating in the direction of an increase in the frequency of EA and unseen alleles. If this hypothesis is true, I want to understand two more things. What is the precise link between the technical change and the change in allele frequency? And can we disentangle how much of this evolution of the frequency over time is due to selection and how much is due to migration? Okay, so that's the hypothesis, and those are the auxiliary questions. Most of the interest is in here. Uh, we mostly use ancient DNA, and then we divide the period that we are interested in, for which we have data, into these five nice uh, periods. And so, these two are non-problematic. When you get here, you start seeing problems because, you see, the Mesolithic goes between 11,000 and 5,000, but the Neolithic goes between 8,000 and 3,000. So if you are born in 7,000 before present, uh, what are you, Mesolithic or Neolithic? And that's, that's a problem. So it has to be solved somehow. Is it clear? So it's not, the distinction between periods is not only a matter of time, it's a matter of something and we'll see what it is. These are the, this is the distribution of our, this is mostly European data distribution. Of course, this, is, this graph is a mess because all the populations are uh, crashed in time. And there is a nice evolution over time. Don't pay much attention to this. It's just that where do we get the data? You will see a better graph in a moment. So, Go back to the hypothesis we want to test. The first simple test is to do comparison of the main polygenic score in different periods. Periods are the five periods I told you. So we follow Cox uh, et al. Last author I think is Metaison, um, and then using the method of Metaison, Metaison, uh, we just do that. We look at the distribution of polygenic score over the different periods and see what happens. Here the problem that I was mentioning comes, because you have to decide, someone born in 7,000 7, years before present, who he is. And the ambiguity is decided this way. Um, the overlap between Mesolithic and Neolithic was all based on whether each individual had more or less than 50% ancestry of, Anatolic, of Anatolia. So if you have more than 50%, you are Neolithic. If you are less, you are uh, Mesolithic. So who you are, it doesn't depend only on the time. It depends on the space. It's a matter of time and space. This is really introducing into the analysis another factor, which we'll see much better in a moment. Be as it may, that's the criteria we use. That's what they use for height. This is what we use. Okay, so once you do that, you get this graph. Now, this really, the late and early upper paleolithic, is a nuisance. We have less than 50 data points here. We report them for completeness, but I think we should focus our attention on the green, blue, and brown spots, which are respectively Mesolithic, Neolithic, and post-Neolithic. This bar tells for the green cloud, which is underlined, uh, what is the mean? So the, bar, the extent of the bar tells you what is the time span of the Mesolithic. And 
the blue gives you the time span of the Neolithic. So you see there is a substantial overlap. What is clear anyway that there is a jump up between Mesolithic and Neolithic, and then a smaller but still significant jump between, jump between Neolithic and post-Neolithic. So this first test tells you, yes, there has been some change significant in the direction of increased frequency of uh, EA alleles. Okay? We run, there is a battery of tests that we run. We do this, uh, I want to go through this fairly quickly because that's not the main point of this talk. So one is, uh, so I'll get a bit technical now, one is based on the QX statistics, Berg and Coop. Um, basically the QX is based on the, the, QX is based on this idea. If there is only drift, you will have a certain dispersion in the allele frequency in the population. <coughs> if you add to this selection, you have an addition, you have now an additional component which will increase the dispersion. So you can compare the dispersion that you have with the compare that with the dispersion that you would have from the null hypothesis of simple drift with no selection, selective effect. So the null hypothesis is described here either by the green line, which is uh, the theoretical chi-square with degrees of freedom equal to the number of the population that you are considering minus one, or the red line, which is uh, the empirical null, they are identical, so we can consider both. And again, there is one comparison that is beyond any doubt between Mesolithic and Neolithic. There has been um, something else than just drift, which is probably selection. Another test is uh, singleton density score. This is only valid for the last 2,000 years. So I won't insist much on this. Uh, this, this is the result. This is the, the p-value of the allele. The support of the hypothesis that has been selection would come from this fact that this, the singleton density score is much higher for uh, the alleles which have uh, um, a high, uh, low p-value, so they're highly significant. And the fact that it's flat before the end reassures us that there is a small population structure effect, population stratification effect. We get two more, we start, I want to make two more tests because the one is fairly simple, the next one introduces some conceptual structure that I, I want to introduce. Is it clear so far? So it looks like there has been somewhere between the Mesolithic and Neolithic, something happened that pushed in the direction of EA enhancing alleles. The next test is a permutation test. The idea is very simple. The, our, the hypothesis that we want perhaps to find support for is that the, the coefficient of the allele uh, met uh, in the change of the frequency of that allele time to some property of that beta. Let's say beta is high or low. And the null hypothesis is that this property of the betas does not matter so under the null, we compare the statistics, which is how much change in frequency you have between the high and the low group. And you do the same change in frequency between high and low group after you arbitrarily um, uh, reassign labels. And if the null is true, you shouldn't see any difference. If the null is false, you should see a difference. So formally, the statistic that we are considering is built in two steps. You see for the allele K, the population M, the change in frequency between population M and the previous population at that allele. You compute the, the mean frequency, the mean change in frequency at that allele in the population M and the main 
and the change in frequency in the high and in the low. This should be M, in the high and in the low. And then you compare the same thing when uh, you permute randomly the labels. And we all com you compare the empirical distribution that you have with uh, many permutations to test the null hypothesis. And you find that, again, the result that I mentioned. When you, so, for example, this, in this, let's focus just on this. The high betas are the betas for the allele that have a positive effect. The low betas are those that have a negative effect. So you compare the change in frequency of the high that is positive effect and low, uh, negative effect, and you compare it with the uh, empirical distribution that you obtain by randomly reassigning the labels. And the statistics is positive and is, it's, okay, it's 3.6%, uh, the mean change in allele frequency, and uh, is highly significant. It's also significant, but small in the post neolithic Okay. I don't know, all this may sound mysterious. I mean, what happened here? I, I want to start going more in detail. Okay. What, what happened? So some, something happened 14 to 8,000 years before present. What is it? So I want to build a model. That's what I do professionally. So I'll start doing that. So really, the hypothesis that we are testing is this. There are two fitness functions described here in the standard Gaussian form. These are not probability distributions. The height, the maximum, and the spread may change independently. Okay, it's a fitness function. If you have a phenotype like this, your fitness, if you're red, is this. And if you have a phenotype like this and you're red, your fitness is much higher. We give a more concrete, uh, we'll be more concrete in a moment. So what we test is this hypothesis. Has there been somewhere in the past a shift in the fitness function? We don't know which direction can be increased or decreased. So the fitness function means in the, if you are red, your optimal value is this. If you are green, your optimal value is 1.5. So has there been this shift? So to do that, you need to provide the MIF with a max with a likelihood function that you want to maximize, and I will do that. So the model I build is uh, we build is uh, right Fisher finite population with mutation and selection. If you don't know what bright Fisher is, you will see it in a the unit of selection, as in Bright Fisher, is the genotype, but we have to change a little bit Bright Fisher because Bright Fisher has the inconvenient that if you follow the path described and you take the gene the genotype as the unit of selection, you tend to deviate from hard divide back. So at some point, I hope you know what hard divide back. You deviate from hard divide back. You don't want to do that, otherwise your data are no good. So I want to introduce random mating to get back to Hardy-Weinberg in every period. So we model random mating so that the elite population is always in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium in every period. And then selection operates through a fitness function. OK, next slide is technical, but you know, it's just standard. Combine. I put together Bright Fisher and Hardy-Weinberg Notation is this, M is the population size, for the moment is fixed. There are uh, two M number of alleles. This is the set of genotypes. Okay, 0, 1, 2 to the power K, K is the number of alleles of interest. This is the frequency of the kth allele. So this is a vector K long, which gives you the frequency of the allele. And uh, X is going to be the distribution over the genotype that 
that describes the state of the population at every point in time, mu is the mutation. That's the basic notation. And now I'll describe for you a stochastic process that in every period determines what the next frequency is, putting on the elements that I described for you together. Uh, oh no, sorry, still have to, the, have to describe what uh, phenotype is just a linear combination of your genotype as As we always do, these are the alphas, these are the Fisher alphas. Uh, what we estimate, the, the betas that we derive from a GWAS are the estimates of these alphas. There is a fitness function in the two cases that we consider. One is directional. You want more of the phenotype. If you are, if Z is uh, EA or intelligence, you want more of the that phenotype, if this omega, of course, is positive, or stabilizing Gaussian, you want to be close to zeta hat, to some zeta hat, like the example that I showed you before. But something more complex, we'll get that in a moment, and then you take the exponential again. That's the fitness function. Okay, now you put everything together. And so I'll start, I'll describe for you Oh, yeah. I start from a P, and I end up with a P plus one uh, in the next period. Uh, ah, sorry. I'm sorry. I had shift. This is the slide I want to focus. Here is the P I want. You start with a P, and you end up with a PT plus one, next generation. I don't use, we don't use the continuous time, it's just discrete time. So it goes like this. You have the, the initial the, the distribution of alleles today. There is a mutation, so mutation away or into the uh, the allele that you are considering. So this is a binomial with this distribution. Then you put the distribution that you obtain into Hardy Weinberg. You create a distribution over the genotype by taking the product of the margin. Also, you ignore linkage, linkage disequilibrium. Then you let operate selection operate, and you get the new distribution over the genotype. Um, now, Wright Fisher comes in. That's the step you may have not known. So the new population is: you have this distribution over the genotype. You have this population. The new population is the multinomial with this number of outcomes according to this probability. That's the new population. And then you recompute the allele frequency in this new population and you obtain your new P. And you have completed the process. You have gone from one P to another P and you want to study the time path of this allele frequency. So the other, in the last uh, bullet point, does that allow for... Thank you for asking question. I did it. Yes, okay. For assortative mating. Excuse me? Does that... Uh, assortative mating comes really here. Sorry. Random mating. Maybe I didn't understand the question. So, so the last one is how people mate and generate the new generation, right? No. How they mate... Well, the mate is here. Okay. If it is random mating, it's... It's random mating, but it's not so. Okay. This is simply the fact that if you have A, okay, upper and lower, in the genotype, you give half of the new capital A. If you have both A, you give one. Okay. okay? Okay, it's very simple to add. Yes. But sorry, suppose you do want to um, add to this model. Suppose that you want to add to this model a sort of mating. You can do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It is not, it is not analytically complicated. There is a sort of it mating twists the thing a little bit. I'll send you my paper, you will see. Twists a little bit. 
in the grand scheme of things, I don't know how assorted the mating was among hunter-gatherers, but I can make something up. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you can put it in. I guarantee you that nothing will change. Okay? Is that okay? I mean, look, the one thing you know of the polygenic score is that it's in hard divine by, by the way, it's hard divine by, by definition, because if it is not, you throw away the idea. And first, and second, that is normally distributed. So you have to keep these things in your mode. Otherwise, you are off, off the tangent. Is that OK? So uh, random versus assortative mating is the last of my words. Okay. So OK, so this is the process. It's very easy to look at this process because um, So let, let's summarize what we have done. You have a P, and you go to the next P. It's a stochastic process which depends on the K, the cardinality of the relevant SNPs, the population side, the mutation rate. I call it Psi. So you take a P, and you get a new P, which I call Phi of Psi of P. OK? That's a new leaf frequency. And you want to study how. You will see the pictures if I show how this changes. And you can make a computation, and you see it has this form. OK, this form may sound mysterious, but once you realize that this is an incremental ratio, you say, oh, oh it's a derivative. And then you get this formula. Please just focus on this formula, because it tells everything you need to know, which is, uh, I say approximately, because here you are really taking the expectation on all the alleles except the one that you are considering. So here there should be a minus k. I don't put it because I'm not that pedantic. But it's really that is a minus k. Okay? So I pay the price of putting this approximation and I use this. So this number now is common. Let's examine this. So this is telling you how much the allele frequency changes from one generation to the next. It has three pieces. One, of course, is the beta. If beta is zero, you just drift. This piece tells you that you don't go out of the 0, 1 interval. OK? So if you are close to 0 or 1, you stop. This is the core of the path. And it's really, think of it as the average slope of the fitness function, which is really what it is, weighted by the average fitness. So you take the derivative, and it's on average, the push is in the direction of a higher phenotype or of a lower phenotype. And what, which one it is depends on this expectation. OK, you will see this in action. It's really nice. Uh, OK, one outcome of this is that now you can write a likelihood function. Because if the, um, if the fitness function is either directional or stabilizing, you get you get a combination of Gaussians. So you complete the square, you get a likelihood function. So you can compute the likelihood function, you can maximum likelihood, and you estimate the maximum likelihood parameters. One is omega d is for the directional and omega s. Maybe you forgot, but there is an omega s which is telling you how sharp the fitness function is. The larger the the more shrunk the fitness function is. And zeta hat is what you want to be. Very smart, very dumb. OK? And you find the thing that we have found already many times, that between Mesolithic and Neolithic, there has been an increase of the z hat from minus 6. These numbers don't mean anything, but you have to ch check and compare them to the other. So a substantial increase in the z hat, you want to you want to go from being dumb to being smart, if I may use this very rough terms. And uh, the steepness has increased. This is for the stabilizing. I'm just saying, we confirm for the fifth time this claim that somewhere, be not somewhere, between the Mesolithic and Neolithic, this happened. You, you wanted to go from being. Dumb to be smart. Yes. 
this question that reflects my ignorance then, so <laughs> feel free to skip it. But um, I can, if if I think of EA, I will, the fitness function, if I understand what it is, is um, probably monotonic rather than a step. It's going to climb. Sorry? It's going to climb. Yeah, but I don't see the, the the drift in the in the in the sharpness with that intuitively, but, you know when when you gave the example with the uh, with the green, I was thinking BMI. So you want to be not too light or not too heavy, and so you have that shape. But for EA, you don't want to be too small. You know, let me be indiscreet. When was the last time you were in fight? <laughs> So I've been working on and off in a farm since I was 10. I can tell you one thing, it's real, real, really done. So you don't want to be too smart. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> so you don't want to be stupid because you have to plan, but when you are too, <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sort of joking, but Okay, the mathematical reason for having this fat is declines, otherwise the allele keeps floating. Everything goes to one. But I think there is a good reason for having a declining shape. Now, if you are asking, well, this is a very simple picture of the technology that is available, I completely agree with you, and maybe we should put some effort in understanding how the different technologies uh, Come in, yeah, which is one way. May, may, because maybe the discussion in a moment is going to be more concrete. Maybe yeah. one way to do it is to say EA uh, captures one aspect of of change and of what humans are. There are other stuff that completely agree. We are focusing. It's a little bit. This there is a little bit of a straight line. I agree. But, well, can't you compute other polygenic scores with the you know, from, from the same data that you had, mm -hmm. uh, you computed the EA polygenic score, but you could do other polygenic scores. You could do the BMI, you could do height, you could do... Yeah. Very good point. We'll think seriously about that, yes. Uh, but I'm really asking you, do you believe this entire picture? Then I can start going, doing this more. <laughs> you should ask that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a question um, about about your model. So it, it seems like your model is, is assuming you have like a self-contained population and that you don't have migrations in. It's right? getting there. Let's get there. I'm getting there. Okay. I'm getting there. I'm getting here. Because it's... Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I said, well, what happened here? It's all weird. I'm, I'm not happy about it. So I want to give some flesh to this picture. So here are the flesh has two components. One is the population structure and migration pattern. The other one is climate change. So here are the years before present. Oh. Okay, so there are two schools of thought. You should put the present on the right or on the left. Yes. <laughs> the present, as you can see, is on the right. Taste among quarters. <laughs> so this is the evolution over time. Actually, let's look. This is much more clear. Red is Western hunter-gatherers. E, blue, is Eastern hunter-gatherers. Green is Anatolian farmers. That's me. And uh, <laughs> YS is uh, Yamnak. Uh, Yamnak. These are three waves that come in in different points in time. And we have to take that into account. As you can see, the, the, the pregnancy population changes. So this is the fraction of uh, Western hunter-gatherers. As you can see, there is very little of hunter-gatherers in us. OK, I have three slides that I'm sure will make some people in this room cringe. So I did, I compute, computed the, the mean polygenic score for the four populations. And uh, these are the Western hunter-gatherers. 
Well, I don't want to insist too much. It's just give you to give you a reference. If you look at the distribution, this is the distribution of the genotype of the Western hunter-gatherers. These are the other three populations. These are the young man. So there is a big difference. You can tell me, yes, there is population of stratification, and I'm saying, which maybe is overestimating the difference, I'm saying there is a fixation problem which underestimates the difference. So I'm open to discussion on this issue. You can look at the naive distance. Uh, you see that the Western hunter-gatherers is a group by themselves. Anyway, this is the population structure we have to deal with. This is the very interesting graph, and it shows you how this is the composition of the sample that we have over time. So here is 10,000 before present, 9, 8, 7. So you see up to here, you see some green appearing in here in Turkey, in Anatolia, then spreading. Then 7,000, really, there's a lot of action going on. 7, 8, 6, and 5,000 Anatolian farmers spread all over Europe. And then from 4,000 on, the YS group starts coming in from the east. So we focus on this. This is a crucial transition. We change fraction of population from uh, Western hunter-gatherers to Anatolian farm. That's the first part. And the jump is around here. The jump that you have seen before is up and around there. Uh, to make it even more synthetic, look, uh, uh, there is one lesson here to be learned. Migration spreads reasonably fast if you want to compute the speed. Is You can see it in this picture, or you can see in the next one by looking at regressions. You have to cover about 3,000 kilometers in 3,000 years. So that gives you the spread, the speed of about one kilometer per year, which was the original Cavalli Sforza estimate of the speed of migration, based on data that have been put under scrutiny, but roughly the estimate is still that. Migration movement that moves at the speed of one kilometer per year starts around here, is completed around here. So that's the picture we want to explain. Uh, and you know, these people are not coming from the sky. They must have been, that's my main claim, they must have been coming from a selection process that happened early. So let's look at that selection process. There is, so there is a big change, sorry, which is a climate change. This flower here is the driest. It's a flower that appears when the, the temperature falls. Uh, so how does the weather change? Okay, here the present is on the, I am so sorry with this present going on the right, on the, the present here is on the right. This is a, a pa genetic paper, but is now used the standard to illustrate the change in temperature from uh, 20,000 years before present to 1950. It's very simple. Icing condition goes up in the bowling aleroid period, then goes down in the young dryas, and then picks up again. Um, here, so this is the temperature in Greenland. So you may say, why do we care about the temperature in Greenland? Well, the other thing you can check is the temperature in the Sore Cave. The Sore Cave is Sore Cave is a cave a few miles south of Jerusalem. So it's it's right in the middle of the Fertile Crescent, which is our the object of our attention, and uh, it gives the path of temperature there. This is the path reported in the paper. I've been always being mystified by this. That's not really how the temperature is. The temperature in the solar cave is this. Uh, so, I mean, we really have data on the ratio of the 18 to 16 isotope of oxygen. From that, there is an Epstein formula that converts it to temperature. I am doing that. I don't show you the isotope. So that's the temperature. Now, 
the present is here. I apologize again. So, icing condition, temperature is around 10 to 15 centigrade. Goes up, then goes down in the younger dryer, then dies, then goes up again. Now it's around about 25, and then slowly declines around 20, which is the current temperature. What we learn from this picture is there are conditions for agriculture which are favorable around this period. Maybe here in this period, and then again in this period. That's where the selection operates. Uh, uh, 10 minutes? Five, if you want, if you want discussion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to explain all this. So the model I'm using is this. So do you remember the shift in the fitness function that we tested? I'm now considering it as the outcome of two technologies. One is... Um, hunter-gatherer technology, the other one is agricultural technology. So, the model I have is this, and now every person in a population can choose either the hunter-gatherer or the agricultural. And so the fitness function is really this. So has a peak if you choose hunter-gatherer, has another peak if you choose agriculture. Now you apply the formula that I was telling you to this situation, and you see how the allele frequency develops over time. And I will, uh, so if you have some feeling for stochastic differential equation, you will see there are two, stable, two steady states, one here and one here on hunter-gatherers and uh, agriculture, where it is depends on the relative height of the agricultural fitness function when the climate becomes more, becomes more warm, this peak goes up this way, and so this now becomes a trap. So now you can look at what happens in the model that I described with the fitness function that the two fitness function coexist. You can choose one or the other. And the allele frequency will change depending on the height of the agricultural fitness function. You will get two main conclusions. One is that there is going to be a sudden shift in the allele frequency from concentrated on low phenotype, EA is our phenotype, to a high phenotype as this peak goes up. And second, where you end up depends a lot on the initial condition. Let me illustrate this. You will see four pictures. This is the profile of the two fitness functions. The, the red is the peak of the hunter-gatherer. The green is the peak of the agriculture. When agriculture is less productive than hunter-gatherer, the phenotype concentrates on this. The allele frequency concentrates on the not EA enhancing alleles, the distribution is approximately normal. You have a negative correlation between the beta and the frequency. When the green thing, when the green function goes up, that's the only thing that changes. The picture changes completely to this. Now this becomes the attractor. The phenotype shifts to here. The allele frequency moves in the direction of EA enhancing. The distribution of the phenotype increases to the optimal phenotype for agriculture. The allele frequency now is positively correlated with the peak. This is with small population size. 
if you increase the population size, nothing happens. The only thing that this thing becomes smoother, but the pattern is the same. Okay? Second thing is the speed. This process takes about, so let's see here in the number of generations. After 50 generations, we are close to the equilibrium after 100. So this is 2,500 meters. We are close to the equilibrium. If you continue for 1,000 generations, nothing happens. So you are really in the relevant equilibrium approximately 50 to 100 generations. So the process is this fast. It's about 2,000 units, which is the scale of the phenomena that we have observed. Um, this is holds both in the case of low productivity in agriculture or high productivity in agriculture. Uh, second thing is where you start determines where you end up. So the final distribution depends on the initial distribution of the alleles, here is a very simple picture to show you this. I, I put the initial allele frequency at varying from 0 to 1. Here is the, so the, on the x-axis you see the value of the initial distribution. On the y-axis you see where it converges. <coughs> so what is changing here, nothing else is changing, only the initial frequency. When you cross a threshold, the long run equilibrium changes to uh, the high frequency. This is, if you look at the, at the box plot. Uh, and the profile, this is the profile of the allele frequency. Here is when you have uh, low productivity in agriculture, high productivity in agriculture. Okay. Let me go to the conclusion because I understand there's been a lot of stuff. Main conclusions. There's been a selective pressure in the direction of EA and ANSIN in about uh, the period, I would say, between 15K and 7K before present. <coughs> the time evolution of the distribution of genotype is produced in part by the change in productivity of two technology, hunter gatherer and agriculture, due to climate change. The evolution is a combination of selection that produces the initial high frequency in, of the EA enhancing alleles, presumably around the fertile crescent where the weather becomes uh, better. There is a speed of selection which is in, coming from the theoretical model which is in line with the observed phenomena. And uh, the diffusion that of new populations that you have seen in the period from 7,000 to 5,000 can be very fast because the initial condition determines uh, where you end up. Let me explain this, which was the last point. Take a position in space, which is above the fertile crust. The temperature has increased, but not necessarily enough to make it favorable to agriculture. If there is mutation into that region from regions like uh, Anatolia, the population that is migrating is already at the allele frequency that is close to the equilibrium of the, that is favorable to agriculture. So the chain reaction that we observe in the data is coming from this uh, dependence of the direction of the selection on the initial condition. That's it. Is time for a question or two? Uh, I, would, I would finish up on uh, selection, not in terms of, I guess, natural selection, but selection of what species survive. So, so I mean, what are, right? Like, depending on kind of things people do and they're going to be in conditions that sort of survive in order to extract the DNA or not? Selection here is simply, in a fixed population model, selection is how many of people like you 
you will find in the next generation. So, part so of I have two genotypes, and I want to know how many of us are going to be so that now 1% and 2%. The selection tells me how much of these two genotypes I will have in the next generation. So part of this can be that... So, yes, if in a fixed population, you can think of it as how many will survive, yes. But I mean survival, sort of like being able to extract the DNA, right? Like we have some species that sort of, do you, do you know what I mean? I mean you're using, do we have the bones of the kings or the farmers? Exactly, or, exactly. Does that change over time, right? Thank you. Do we have the bones, like to extract the DNA of the kings or the farmers? And does that change over time? I think that's the question. Maybe for some periods we have more of the kings and some periods we have more of the farmers. More of the what? Kings or farmers, the, the, the DNA. Uh -huh. We have a different periods, might be different. Are we getting the individuals that are the, the king or the the head of the clan or, or something like that in some places because their the bureau is different for different populations? No, I don't understand. Okay. <laughs> no, he's, no, saying, he's, right, right? He's, uh, he's saying there, so you talk about your data. Uh, are ancient we, uh, DNA data. Right, the ancient yeah. DNA data. Is it, is it, uh, is there like a sample selection bias because at some point you were getting the high class people, oh, and yes. at another point you were getting the low class people, and that's the only reason you're seeing a change? Yeah. So no, most of the data are real. Most of the data are coming from random selection. These are people that you don't find in a grave because they're kings or so. So, from that objection, this is not an objection to us. An objection to I think it's a, an actual objection that people have about ancient DNA research, though, right? Is that you don't, um, uh, I mean, you, the, the type of person that you can find and, um, buried in a great, like, you know, you're not finding them in the pyramids, that's right. Yeah. But, but, but you are finding them in, in graves that are, are better preserved than someone who, like, died in a field somewhere. Yeah. So it's a concern that has to be addressed. Yeah. Can I answer all these questions? Uh, well, maybe one more. Well, okay. then we'll have we'll have a break to discuss. Go ahead, Peter. I have one question because your pop you showed that the populations change, that the different populations over time, and then uh, the polygenic score for educational attainment is based on the current population, and we know that it will predict less in other populations in the past. So the ones that we don't see anymore. Uh, they'll look dumber because the polygenic score is less predictive. Yeah. It, so I'm trying to say, can we really say that there is EA enhancing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, so that's the objection I was announcing. So what you said is there is population certification. So maybe since the population on which we are basing our data is closer to the Anatolian farmers, we have a bias. I'm countering to that. We are forgetting that there's another phenomenon which tends to underestimate the difference, which is you have an allele in the Western hunter gatherers that is now not zero on one, but now that allele gets fixated. So now you will not find. So it is probably EA and ATSI. Now that is fixated. So when you do the GWAS, you don't see that allele. So we have to, and I think the model can address this issue, and this is one of the things we plan to do. You agree that there is this counter, right? That this goes in the, in the exactly opposite direction than, than the population certification. And it's substantial, because many of these are leaving gets fixed. And so you lose that when you do the genes. And one test would be doing several polygenic scores, maybe. Can you do several polygenic scores? So I did, I put the distance. So if you look at the distance, the name distance between the populations, the what you see is that the distance uh, in the EA uh, SNPs is larger than the general population distance. So which tends to support this idea that the fixation matters a lot. 